All right. Well, thank you guys for leading us in worship this morning, and I hope everyone is doing uh, good on your end. Um, it is uh, still a unique thing right. getting together like this on Zoom, and I know that so many of you are uh, probably getting used to this by now. I think we all are a little bit, um, but we're still gathering. Uh, I, I see a few of you shaking your heads. No, you're ready to get back together, and, uh, and so am I. We're, uh, we're hoping to be back together um, in the middle of July. Right now, our tentative date is July 19th. And so uh, right now, we see no reason why we won't hit that and uh, be able to meet again on July 19th. So just be, uh, Mark, be aware of that. But today, we're kicking off a new series called Standoff. And if I have heard it once, I've probably heard it a thousand times during this quarantine, that uh, people need help parenting. Because all of us, especially if you have children in the home, some of you don't, and I don't want this to this series to totally be lost on you. If you don't have kids in the home or you're single and you don't have kids yet or you're not married yet, don't have kids, that kind of thing, um, I don't want you to feel like this isn't for you, even though every time we say that on a parenting series, it probably still feels like it's not for you. But I just want to make, make that aware and just know that when we study God's word, there's always application for us, even if it's not specifically about the, the topic or the issue that we're dealing with. <clears throat> so hang in there. We're going to get to the scripture in just a moment. But, um, but I think all of us with kids in the home, uh, we felt a unique pressure when all of this came down with the coronavirus. We all got forced at home. And it's not that we hate our children or don't like being home with our kids and that kind of thing. It just is a different pressure. Uh, we're sort of geared up for it for the summer. Most of us are. We have our, we, we figure out our arrangement with work schedules. We figure out camps and daycares and all the things that we have to do to be prepared for this two or three month window where we have kids at home. But when that got extended by two or three months, we just weren't ready. And then on top of that, just all the stress and fears related to what's going on, um, it's only made things worse. And so I have heard from just dozens and dozens of parents that they need help during this time. So we're going to talk about some parenting things uh, as we get into this. It's called the uh, standoff, the battle of the wills, uh, parenting in the battle of the wills. And that's really what parenting is about. It's a battle of wills. And those wills are not just the wills of your children. Some of that is the battle of your own will. And, and having to face who you are in this whole journey of, of parenting and what God has, has given you. And so um, this is kind of a cool weekend for us. Um, if you don't know our setup, uh, some of you may be new to who I am and our family, but uh, my wife, Amanda, and I, we have five children, and they're all boys. And so uh, some of you who have girls, I am clueless about girls. All I know is boys. And in that, that regard, uh, we have lots of experience. At the same time, we don't feel like we're experts by any stretch. Um, in fact, probably the number of children times the cumulative experience equals more cumulative mistakes in parenting than most of you. So I think probably I can safely say that most of you, we've made more parenting mistakes than most of you. Um, and that's just the reality of parenting. Um, but today is actually my son Ford's birthday. So we have a, uh, our oldest is 16. And then we have 13 year old my son Cooper, he was in here a minute ago. He's our son with Down syndrome. And then we have an 11 year old named Wesley. And then we have our brand new nine year old, uh, nine years old today, Ford Neil Savage. And then we have our youngest Joshua, who is seven. And so our house is lively, but um, we're celebrating <clears throat> Ford's birthday this weekend. And I attempted to put in a basketball goal yesterday. So my son Ford's big into basketball. So we finally bought an in ground basketball hoop. And I don't, I don't remember ever putting one of these in, but the systems today are incredibly complicated and I'm actually okay at things like this, but it took me three trips to Lowe's and over, and for whatever reason, I think I just dug the hole too big, but <laughs> I put over a thousand pounds of concrete in the ground, holding this post in the ground. So um, I will have the strongest basketball goal in the city of Memphis. So uh, that's, that's, we have to still put the actual goal together and set it in place today, but uh, I did that yesterday, and it was, uh, uh, as usual, a project at my house usually comes with its share of blood, sweat, and tears, and that's yesterday was no exception. So um, here we are. If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Ephesians. So if you've been uh, with us, we have been going through a series since January, uh, going through the book of Ephesians, and I'm a big fan of this. I, don't, I can't say I'm, I'm going to promise to always do this every single time we do a, a, uh, a sermon, but I like what I, what I would call expository preaching, which is basically taking a passage of scripture, starting in the beginning and going through it from beginning to end in a very linear fashion. I really like that. That's a, that probably just 
appeals to me in certain ways. So I, I gravitate towards that in my teaching. Even if I'm teaching topically, I usually pick a passage of scripture and walk us through it from start to finish, because I feel like that's the clearest way for us to gain understanding around what God has to say for us. Because uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what my opinion is or what your opinion is. What we're really looking for is God's wisdom, God's insight and truth for our lives. And I, I believe that's going to be found in the pages of scripture. And so we've been going through the book of Ephesians and we have gotten all the way through the, the meaty beginning, which by the way, if you don't, if you haven't followed along, the beginning of Ephesians is highly theological. Lots of major theological underpinnings to our faith are presented in the first three to three and a half chapters of Ephesians. And, and they're massive topics, like the whole doctrine of, of election and predestination and who we are in Christ and, and what it was like before Christ. All these major theological tenets of our faith exist in that first half. And then Paul makes a pretty sharp turn into the practical living of the Christian life. And so essentially, uh, chapters four, five, and six are all about Christian living, what it means to live out your faith in the Christian life. So here's the problem. If we just try to jump into Christian living without understanding the theological and doctrinal underpinnings of that, we will often get off track and we will, we will misunderstand what God's trying to do. And so we're going to actually run into one of those issues today as we get into the parenting thing. But we have to understand uh, where, where we're coming from theologically before we can actually jump into the practicals. And when I'm counseling and coaching people, most people just want practically, how do I fix the problem? And I think that is more of a symptom of being a fast-paced, uh, uh, solution-focused American. That's, that's more of a Western type of thought. Um, uh, Hebrew thought and, and early Christian thought was very process-oriented. So it was this idea of we are in a journey together with God. And because of that, there's lots of seasons of patience and waiting and trusting God when we don't have answers. And that goes, that's very opposed to the American Western thinking. We like our answers provided for us immediately. And, and so that's why some of us have a, a real challenge with following God. It makes it really hard when you want immediate response <clears throat> and God often works through process. So you'll hear me talk, talk through process a lot anytime you hear me talk, because I just don't think there are quick answers to any major problems. I think we have to embrace the process of God working through uh, our, in our lives through time, across time. So here we are in Ephesians chapter six, and uh, we just came out of the cha of chapter five, which focuses quite heavily on marriage. And then we get into this whole issue of children and parenting. So he says in verse one, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. So right off the bat, Paul dives in and starts talking about this idea of children obeying your parents. Now, this is not a foreign command. This comes right out of uh, the Ten Commandments. This is so. If you were if you were reading this for the first time and you lived in Ephesus and you had any understanding of Judaism, if you came from Jewish background, you would have immediately identified this as, oh, that's one of the Ten Commandments: obey your parents and or honor your father and your mother. Is probably how you learned it. Um, and so we see this and we go, okay, there's nothing really radical about that. And and I want to say right off the bat that part of the parenting journey for you is understanding this idea of what I would call healthy authority. Healthy authority is one of those things that we don't have a great concept for in our country because most of our concepts of authority revolve around power. And, and that's a faulty idea. And, and I slip into this in my own parenting. In fact, when I think about my parenting as a dad, I will tell you half, probably about half the time, I am frustrated at my own lack of uh, understanding about some of the very things I would teach. It's so hard because I think all of us would agree, parenting is a never ending thing. It's constant every single day, all the time. So when I slip up, it's like, gosh, why do I not follow through with the very things I would teach in a sermon? And it's part of it's because sermon is not real life. Real life is what you do after the sermon. And, and so when I, I'm the same way, I am frustrated with my parenting half the time. Sometimes I default to a false understanding of authority, which is just to yell and scream at my kids and just e execute power. And I can, I can express power so much easier than healthy authority. And so this is what we're going to go on the journey for in this series is really help, helping us understand what healthy authority looks like for us as parents. But here he says right off the bat, children, obey your parents uh, because you belong to the Lord. 
this is the right thing to do. So I'm going to tell you in the, in the spirit of healthy authority over your children, expecting them to obey you is the right thing to do. It is, it is right for you to expect your children that are, that I would say that are minors under that age of, uh, of being on their own. It is right for you to expect them to obey and to honor the words you say. But this also raises the essential problem of parenting which is the fact that even though children are commanded to obey their parents, they don't do it. They don't do a good job of this. Uh, obedience is, is not easy for any of us. And it, it raises the issue, which is, I, was, I told you we'd run into this, that we are now coming against a very deep and theological issue. And I'm going to try to illustrate on the board a little bit. Um, so when it comes to, let me just say this, children... And by the way, you can put yourself in the category of children for this part of the discussion. So you and, and obedience. So our obedience, children, obedience stems and, and our, our problem with this stems from a problem in our human condition. We have to understand human condition because children obeying their parents, when this is the fundamental problem of parenting. If your children obeyed you all the time, you wouldn't care about parenting, the parenting series. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be reading parenting books. You would, you would be a master, right? You, you have it all figured out if your children obey you. The problem is the fact that our children not obey, because of that, it points to their human condition. And the human condition is something Paul has already talked about. So the so I want I, I do this to to partly ease your minds a little bit regarding the parenting journey because when we parent our kids and we realize man they don't obey it's it's very easy for us to get really discouraged as parents to go well man we're terrible parents we can't we can't even get our kids to obey us and we we get really down on ourselves let me go back to Ephesians chapter two that's the section of the of the book of Ephesians that's more on the theological side uh, Ephesians two four and five says. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised us, uh, when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So what Paul's saying is, that little, little sentence in there, verse 5, he says, even though you were dead in your sins, the human condition is that we are sinful. And it's very important at birth. It is very important for you to understand this. Now, this is very contrary to popular belief today. Uh, everywhere you go, people will say uh, humanity is basically good, not basically evil or wrong. I'm going to take issue with that with our culture, mostly because of the Bible, but also because I've met people. And the basic problem with hu the human condition is we are sinful. Uh, all of your children learned to uh, or did not have to learn to disobey. They, they came factory equipped for disobedience. You did not have to teach your children that. But any effort you put towards your children is always pushing them from negative to positive because they were born sinful. And so they had sin to overcome. And so this is what Paul's getting at. He's referring to back in Ephesians 6, children obey your parents for this is the right thing to do. Parents, our takeaway from that is it is right to hold your children accountable and expect them to obey the things you say. That's the expectation of parenting. Why? Because we're overcoming a human condition problem. This is the task of parenting, is that we have to overcome this issue of the fact that our kids are sinful at birth, that they're born into this, and so they get sucked into this way of thinking. These are the, the fact that they don't obey is, is evidence that the fall of creation has damaged life as we know it. We don't, have, uh, we don't have that understanding. So what we hope for, and this is the whole thing, because the human condition is sinful, we need a redemptive process. Not a simple answer, but a redemptive process. So God did the first thing, which is he sent his son Jesus to redeem us. It is through the grace of Christ that, we're, that our sinful condition is redeemed. And on top of that, in partnership with that work, is the role of parents in the home. Parents, you play a vital role in, in the redemptive process of your children. And it comes to this idea of healthy authority expressed in the, in the home and over children, is that you would understand their human condition, and it's important to understand that your child is human, 
And this is hard for them, just like it's hard for us in our relationship with God. You know, we talk about it all the time. And I tell you, be a fly on the wall in our house for a couple of days. But we get frustrated because it's, it's really not the frustration. I thought, it, I used to think our frustration was they don't obey us the first time we say it. That's really not my frustration. My frustration is they don't obey us the 20th time I've said it. That's my problem. That's my real issue is that this, this human condition of being sinful runs so deep inside of them, so deep inside of me, that the, the prospect of obedience means great effort has to go in to train me to be obedient, to train a child in the way they should go is how the Proverbs would say it. And so part of your role as a parent is to play along in the redemptive process by bringing healthy authority over your kids and expecting them to obey. So there's some, there's some pieces to this equation. I think you can see this on the board. Boundaries, you've heard me talk about boundaries a lot. Boundaries are a big deal. Boundaries, and some of you might call these rules. Rules and boundaries are essentially the same thing. I like boundaries because uh, sometimes rules uh, are thrown into a category of uh, purely punitive and like you have rules on you because you've done wrong. We put boundaries in place because uh, even if even if you haven't done wrong, the boundaries still exist. So we have boundaries and um, what's my other thing? Uh, boundaries, consequences, and expectations. So Boundaries, consequences, expectations, all three of these have to come into play in your parenting. You have to establish boundaries. You have to establish expectations. There's expectations on your kids. And then there have to be consequences that hold all of that together. In other words, there have to be consequences that if you don't obey, if you don't meet the, the, the boundary or the expectation, there's a consequence. And why do we teach our children that? Why do we bring consequences? Why do we bring, in some cases, pain into their lives? because we don't want them to leave our care and go out there and suffer greater pain on their own. So that's what, that's the beauty of the redemptive process is that because your kids are sinful and they're going to find their way to, to disobedience easily, then you're going to create boundaries and expectations and appropriate consequences to their actions in the safety of your home so that your kids can grow up and understand the relationship between their choices and outcomes. And then they, then they start to learn. So what you're doing is you're actually straightening out what was already bent. And uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, Jake was teaching, he used the illustration of the uh, coat hanger and how the redemptive process of God is like straightening out something that we uh, twisted and bent in our own lives. And that's a lot of what we're doing in parenting is we're having to give our kids a better direction in life. And really we are representing the destiny God has for them through our parenting. Um, so uh, a couple of things I want you to notice in this passage. Um, it is the sin in our lives that separates us from God. And it is his grace that confronts and reconnects us back to him. And so when we think of grace, a lot of times we think of not coming down on someone, in particular in regard to authority. We think we need to be gracious to our kids. I want to go and establish that grace is not purely being nice. Grace can be nice, but grace means I'm willing to not only confront but I confront with the purpose of connecting, with, with not losing the fact that there's a relationship here. The grace of God works this way in all of our lives. God does not give you grace by turning a blind eye to your sin. God gives you grace in full view of your sin. He sees it. He confronts it. Because of your sin, you need something from God that you don't have on your own. So he confronts it and he says, I'm not going to allow, allow the sin in your life, the problem in your life, to disconnect us relationally. And this is how we have to parent our children, is that we say, through grace, we're going to confront the problem, confront the disobedience or wherever they're off, and we're not going anywhere. That's how you create a safe home for your children to fail and to struggle, but not to lose your relationship with you. And that's, that's one of the most powerful things that you can do for your kids is because they start to get a taste of what a relationship with God looks like. Because now they, they start to taste grace in your home and then they, they begin to recognize it when they find grace through Christ. So verses one through three uh, talks about this whole idea of children obey your parents in the Lord for it's right and, and it will go well with you. 
and that's, there's a promise associated with this, but I want to, I want to mention this one thing. If you look at the text here, he says, children obey your parents. So the emphasis, the, he's addressing children. And I think this is worthy to, to take a moment to, to point out. And that is that um, Paul felt like under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it was right to actually address children in his letter. So the scripture actually speaks directly to children. And so part of the reason I bring that up is because I feel like we maybe separate our kids too much from having a, a place to listen and take in God's word. And maybe it's because we've uh, so gone full into uh, kind of cute Bible stories and, and animated features and all these kind of ways. We sort of, I hate to say this, but we kind of dumb it down for kids. And the reality is Paul goes right after children and says it, it, he's expecting kids to be able to understand the basic principle of obey your parents. And so I, I think as, as moms and dads out there, we need to remember that our kids can, can express faith and, and listen to the word of God and show their faith. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew 18. He says, uh, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as, these, as, as this little child, he was next to a child at the time, he says, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus is actually describing faith, describing what it means to repent of your sins and come to faith, he actually prescribes adults to be more like children, to take on the, the, the humility and the simplicity of a child. So, so much so that I think we can very strongly say the spirit of a child is God's preferred method of engaging us in faith that we would take on that simplicity and humility of a child. And so your children can understand things of faith. They're uniquely qualified to engage things of faith. And sometimes parents get really nervous. They're like, I don't know if my kids fully understand. I don't know if they can answer all the questions correctly. I don't feel like I have all the knowledge. And I'll tell you, I understand that, that tension that that creates and the desire to see our kids answer all the questions right, but that's not what's required for faith. Biblically speaking, your kids don't have to know all the answers because they are uniquely equipped as children to express faith in God without having all the questions answered. The desire for questions to be answered comes from adult thinking, which is the very thing that Jesus confronts in Matthew 18. He says, unless you become, unless you let all that go, you gotta become like a child. So I wanna just tell all of, your, all of you as parents, it's important, especially those you have, like, like we do have kind of younger ones or elementary age kids in your, in your house, don't discount their faith because they don't have all the answers because now we're confusing education and faith. And those are two very different things. It's great to have a good biblical education, but children have the capacity for faith without the education. And that's what Jesus celebrates so much so that highly educated people, Jesus calls to basically not let it go, like forget about it, but let it go in the sense that it's a barrier to entry of faith. He says, that's not what should stop you. Having all the answers is not what, what, what the barrier ought to be. The, the step of faith is believing in something you can't see or fully understand anyway. So I love that Paul brings that in here and addresses that with children. So it is reasonable to expect your kids to obey. It is, it is reasonable that your kids would have faith and, and seek out obedience to their parents because they're seeking to obey God. And so you having appropriate authority over your kids will teach them how to have authority under God. And, and that's really the bigger game we're playing. Because remember, we are only in our kids' lives, at least in the day-to-day, -day, for so long. And the, the line, I used to always say 7,000 days. That's about how long you have in terms of being primary influencer. Certainly, you're going to influence them beyond that. You're going to be a part of their lives beyond that. But the problem is, you will not have the kind of influence you have during those adult years like you have in their childhood years. This is the time for us to truly model the same authority that they would see in our Heavenly Father, which is why literally the most convicting question I face as a dad, and we're going to talk more about this next week on Father's Day, is can my children see their Heavenly Father in me? That is the most convicting thing I feel in my life, is can they see their Heavenly Father when they look at their earthly father? And 
and that's going to be a, a, a lifelong journey for me. I don't think I'm going to figure that out, you know, totally anytime soon, but it's a, it's a journey that we're all on as, as parents. Um, so this issue of sin living in your children um, goes back to the, the process, the fact that this will never be solved. It's certainly not in one day or one moment or one parenting move. You don't solve this issue in children. Um, and it's kind of funny because um, children obeying their parents is an invitation for them to, to walk a path that is contrary to their nature. Said, okay, obeying your parents means you have to fight against something that is natural to you, which is a sinful mentality, which is a disobedient sort of spirit. And uh, Paul actually struggles with this himself in Romans chapter seven. <clears throat> he says, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. <clears throat> this is the apostle Paul. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. And verse 17 this is critical. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And isn't that the truth for all of us? <clears throat> it is sin living in us that leads us down the wrong path. So what we've got to do is we've got to retrain our thinking. We've got to retrain uh, in a spirit of faith that we're going to go against what is natural to us. So the good news and bad news of parenting is the good news is you can help your kids. You can actually help them grow in their faith and help them follow the destiny that God has for them. The bad news is it is an uphill battle the entire way. You are dealing with sinful little critters who are largely opposed to this entire effort called parenting. They are not for you in this. And I don't care how sweet you think your child is. I've got some sweet ones, but I'm just going to tell you at the end of the day, what they care about most is what they want for themselves. And, and you know that to be true. And they'll, they'll, they'll give you the puppy dog eyes. They'll cry. They'll, they'll moan and groan, all these things. But they want what they want for their, themselves. So if you want anything for them that's lasting and good, you're going to have to push through all of that. And that's what our role is as parents. We have to stand off with them sometimes. And, and, the, and the clash of wills will happen. Because we understand it's not really our will that we're after as parents. We are representing what God would want for our kids every time we parent them. So uh, let's keep going. Verse, this is Ephesians 6, verse 2. <clears throat> Paul goes on and says, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So that, now he's getting into the payoff. Verse 3, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have long life on the earth. Now, this is the promise of obedience for, for kids. And I love this, that the scripture does not discount or take away the payoff or the reward of obedience. <clears throat> not just regarding kids, but in all of the Christian life, there's a reward for obedience. In other words, God has basically arranged the universe, the, the world, to work a certain way. When we align with him, things go better for us. And it's not that God is granting special favor on the ones he likes and the, and you know, resisting the ones he doesn't like. It is that God has established boundaries and rules about the way life works. And he has called us to obey his word because that's how life works. So the more we obey God, the more life functions better day to day for, for all of us. And same for children. This is what Paul is using to remind kids, obeying your, your parents is how life goes well for you. Now, this is one of those passages that I believe has been misused and abused. So much so that similar to some of the stuff we talked about in marriage, uh, like wives submitting to husbands and how, how badly that verse has been misused and abused, this one gets abused because some of you, you are adults now, you have your own families, you've been out of your parents' house for years and years and years, <clears throat> and you still struggle with this because you know the Bible says honor your father and mother, but your father and mother don't live honorable lives, and you struggle with that. Maybe your parents have hurt you or harmed you in some way, and you just feel this tension, like, how do I honor them when they live so badly or they've been so hurtful or they've been so, uh, they've mistreated us so badly? I will tell you, the spirit of this text is that you are honoring parents who are relatively honorable. So this is not about saying you have to obey your parents when they are opposed to God and doing the wrong thing. Not at all. 
The idea here is that parental authority is in alignment with divine authority. Not perfectly because we're human, but it's reasonably in alignment with the things of God. And that's why sometimes this is mis misused, like you're supposed to obey your parents when they tell you to do awful things. And that's just not true. Some of you have wrestled with that because you had awful parents growing up and you've you tried your best to obey them and you feel like maybe you have uh, betrayed that trust in some way or whatever. And here he says, honor your father and mother, so your father and mother, so it will go well for you. So some of your, your parents, if you obeyed them or honored them, it would not go well for you because they're not, they're not honorable people. They're not leading you in the way of God. So when we look at this, we have to understand that, that our, in our parenting, our, our goal, and this is the effort of parenting, is to come back and say, okay, does my authority show reasonable alignment with God's authority? Because that's our, that's our accountability. As parents, we are not rogue author authoritarians. We're not out on our own. We, we answer to God for our parenting. That's the whole concept behind delegated authority. God's at the top. He delegates authority down with the expectation that we are answering to God. This is why the president of the United States, when he's inaugurated, he puts his hand on a Bible and he swears an oath to uphold his authority under God. We understand that as our country, even though I don't think we take it seriously anymore. I think that's something we should revisit as a country. However, in our parenting, you're essentially doing this. The day that child is born, it's like you're placing your hand on the Bible saying, God, under your authority, I will raise this child and understand that our authority answers to God. And because of that, I will do what's right, even if everyone else around me is not doing what's right. I'm going to lead my children in a certain way to help them obey. So my job is to point my children to the right, to right living for their future as a child of God. Because one day, your children are going to feel more like they belong to another family more than they belong to your family. Isn't that how it is for all of us as adults? When I talk about my family, I don't really mean my parents or my siblings. I really mean my wife and my children. I'm part of a new family now. And so what you're, as you're raising your children, you are raising them with the mindset that one day they're going to have their own families. They're going to be out on their own. And so they're going to learn how to live under authority towards, towards me and then ultimately towards God in our home. And so this is critical. So what I want to do now is I want to take this thought of being under authority and I want to make this, I do want to make this really practical for you. So let me get my pen, drop my pen. And I want to write on the board four areas of, of obedience and authority that you need to have for your children. These are like mission critical if you're going to raise children today. So the first, let me make sure you get them in the right order. The first is disobedience. Disobedience. Now we've been talking about obeyed versus disobeyed, but this is very specific. And this is the failure to do what mom and dad says. Okay, just basic disobedience. You've said do it and they don't do it. This is, this is a critical area of training your child. Um, basic obedience teaches uh, children honor for authority, even without full understanding. Uh, if you have children who can talk, the answer to most of the things that you ask them to do is why, right? They ask you why. And I will tell you, so many parents spend way too much time explaining why. I do it. I know you do it. You, you think, oh, okay, that's a fair question. Now, let me tell you something. In the world of obedience, that is not a fair question. They don't get the right to ask why. And the more you get them, and I, I have parents argue with this, this whole issue with me all the time. They're like, well, I want my children to understand everything. There are some things your kids can't understand. And you have to accept that reality. And your children have to accept that reality. Otherwise, what will happen is they will learn how to get around your authority because they will learn that they can just talk you down and talk you back. They can talk you out of the things that you feel are right for them. But that doesn't work with God. We don't get to talk God out of anything. And so in, in terms of representing God's authority through, through these uh, steps of obedience, we say, okay, this, the spirit of disobedience in my child, um, I've got to confront that by holding them accountable to the things I say, even if they don't understand. This is, this is a critical area. Every time you explain yourself to your children, you are forfeiting your authority. 
every time you say, well, here's my thinking, here's what I was thinking, blah, 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 blah. And you start trying to negotiate all your kids. Every time you do that, you are forfeiting your authority. So part of what you're training your children to do is to, is to obey you at your word, even if they don't fully understand. So that's number one. Number two is uh, disrespect. So disrespect is the other, uh, I wanted to call these the four horsemen of the apocalypse of parenting. That's what I wanted to call these because these are the four things that will like completely disrupt your family. First being disobedience, the second being disrespect. This is the failure to see people and things the way God does. The failure to see people and things as, as God sees them. So uh, actually, this is a great time to talk about disrespect. Um, in your homes, to teach your children proper respect for people and things, people and property, means you have to have specific discussions to train your children into the, in the right mindset about things. So this past week, we've had several conversations with our kids about racism, because racism at its core is a basic disrespect for people. And so this is how we have to train our kids. We have to confront issues of disrespect in their lives. This is the reason, by the way, why it's, it's, not just a, it's not just a do this or don't do this disobedience issue. Sometimes it's a disrespect issue that your, ki that your kids don't clean up their room. They don't clean up their room shows a disrespect for the place they live. It, it's actually a disrespect for themselves because they're not, they're not living appropriately. They're, they're living in a trash heap called their bedroom and you requiring them to clean it up on a semi-regular basis is showing your child self-respect, that they don't, they don't have to live in a trash heap. And so this is important that we teach our kids basic respect. Uh, it's respect by the way we talk about people, about the, the jokes we tell and don't tell. Um, there's a, you know, I live in a house full of boys and sometimes, it's, sometimes it's my fault and I admit that, but we, man, we get talking about funny things and funny things get to be crude things and then suddenly we're crossing the line of disrespect. And so we have to reel that stuff back in and we have to tell our kids, no, nope, we can't talk that way. We don't say those words. We don't do those things because that's a disrespect issue because what happens at home will eventually trickle out of your home. Count on it. What happens at home will carry over. Um, and it will actually carry over in some pretty powerful ways. Um, one day when your kids get married, they're going to have an argument with their spouse and the argument's going to go something like this. That's not how I was raised. Or the way my parents did it, if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. You've had that argument in your marriage. Everyone has, right? Because for some reason, we think if our parents did it, it sort of justifies everything. The reality is what we're doing is we're just saying, this is what I know. And that creates a tension in our, in our future relationships. And if we don't get a good handle on disrespect, that disrespect will go right with us into the next phase of life as we leave our, leave our homes. And... These are conversations we have uh, with our sons about dating and about how they treat uh, a woman when they go on a date and things like that. But these are important things. So we have to teach our kids basic respect. Um, make sure I got those notes. Okay, number three, dishonesty. Now, I don't think I have to convince you the importance of being honest. Um, we all basically understand the need for honesty. However, uh, your kids have figured out that they can tell a lie and get away with something. They've already figured it out. They know how to be sneaky. They know how to be deceptive. They know how to get their way by not telling the truth. It's the most, like, it's like the easiest human behavior to come up with is to tell a lie or get around the truth. And so uh, we have to teach our kids that telling lies and being dishonest and, dis, uh, uh, and being deceptive is wrong. And it's really important to teach that to your kids um, that they understand they cannot get away with lying. And I know that sometimes your kids, just like mine, they will look at you in the face and they will tell you that they're telling the truth and everything in you wants to believe that your child is innocent. At the same time, you, in, the, in the back of your mind, you're, you got this something checking your spirit. And you're like, wait a minute, I don't know if I really believe them. I see, their, I see the tears. I see the genuineness on their face. I feel like they're telling me the truth, but I, I'm not really sure. And you want to ask that follow-up question, but maybe you're scared of hurting their feelings or breaking their spirit in some way. I'm going to tell you, they need to be accountable to the things they say, and you double-checking, truth-checking their words is okay. And sometimes 
we all need our words truth checked. We need to know that there's an accountability around honesty because just like when you were a kid, being halfway honest is still a lie. When your parents ask you a direct question, did you take the cookies? And you tell the half truth, which is no, because you didn't take the cookies, you ate the cookies. That's a different verb. You didn't really take them. You just sat there and ate them. That's different than taking. I didn't take them anywhere, right? You've, can't, you've come up with a way to get around the exact phrasing your parents use so that you can, with looking them in the eye, you can tell them what's kind of true. You didn't take it anywhere. You've convinced yourself that it's not a lie. That's why parents have to truth check their kids. And don't we all need to grow up with the accountability that someone should be truth checking us? Ultimately, God truth checks us, but the rest of the world does too, right? In business, they truth check you, right? You know, they look at the numbers, they, they check the contract, they, they go back and look at, at what you said earlier to make sure that things get in. It's why you look in the bag every time you order food out of a fast food restaurant, what are you doing? You're truth checking, did they give me what I ordered? And, and it's, a, it's a function of life is that we tell the truth. And so kids need to know that they will be held accountable uh, to the words they say. And that is a vitally important uh, part of parenting. Now, number four, I'm gonna put a little asterisk beside number four, because I believe this is the most important one. Defiance, the defiant spirit, I believe is probably what's behind one, two, and three. But the defiant spirit, I believe, is the, the one you have to get the most handle on. Um, and kids need to get the most handle on. If a child learns to run on a path of defiance, there is so much danger on that path, they can't even fathom it. And some of you know that. Just that defiant spirit of any listening to any wisdom or hearing feedback from any person, that defiant spirit will train wreck your child's life. It's the spirit of the prodigal son. When you go back to that parable that Jesus taught, that son who would not hear wisdom, he would not listen to his father. That idea of just defiance. I'm just gonna go and do my own thing. And <clears throat> I believe it's the worst of the four because if that spirit continues, they will turn that defiance against God. And, and that, will, that will hamstring their entire life. So we really need to think through uh, that spirit of, of defiance. And a lot of parents struggle with that because they'll say, I don't feel like I can give my child a consequence because they did disobey me. They, they stomped up the stairs, slammed their door, and then cleaned their room. So what did they do? Well, they did what you asked them to do. They were obedient, technically speaking, but they did it with a defiant spirit. So what do we do? There must be a consequence for the defiant spirit. Otherwise, the child will say, will realize they can get away. They can wield power through that defiant spirit, which will ultimately damage them. So um, this attitude of resisting authority, we don't want to uh, in any way be uh, complicit in our, helping our child develop a resistance to authority. So every child has their struggle with this. We all, all, all humans struggle with all four of these, and we struggle to uh, to do the right thing. And so we're going to have to trust God to lead us and to guide us out of these bad behaviors. And that's why God gave us parents. All of this comes down to parenting. This is the battle of wills. These are, this is the bad will. This, these are the things that we bring to the table that we confront and that parenting is designed, uh, to bring confrontation to and correction to. This is what we're to, we're to focus on. And that's one of the dangers is it's easy to focus in on the very specific, like nitpicky things. Like I want them to you know, make their bed or I want them to eat their vegetables or things like that. I'm telling you, if you focus on these four things, um, the, the, the reality is, and we struggle with it too. Who cares if our kids eat their vegetables, to be honest, at the end of the day, they're going to figure it out. Um, you know, the whole world seems to be going plant-based anyway. So at some point they're all going to get swept up into it. And they're going to eat their vegetables, but why do we fight over that? And, and you, you can fight over all you want. Permission to fight on whatever battle you want to fight. But these are the bigger issues of parenting, I assure you. These are more important than, than other things. And as I was thinking about uh, this whole message today, I was thinking about the things I struggle with. And, and I've been, for those of you who have been tracking with me on a lot of this stuff, 
one of the things that I struggle with most is the, is the tension between task and relationship. And it is far easier for me. I put everything on a task list. I'm the, I'm the productive minded kind of person. And, but you really can't parent that way. You can't really parent simply with tasks and did they do this or did they do not, did they or not? And all these things, keeping a task list. At some point you have to remember this is at its core, a relationship. You have a relationship with your kids. And, you know, this is my struggle uh, because the busyness of life can suck out the fun and the laughter and all the things that really mean the most in parenting. Uh, for me, my biggest struggle probably in parenting right now is, man, after a long day at work, I walk through the door of my house and, you know, six people are waiting on me. Um, five of them are high energy and like desperate to go play with dad. And all I want to do is just sit for a few minutes. Like, you know, is there any harm in me just sitting for a few minutes? Apparently there's much harm in me sitting for just a few minutes. They don't, they don't like that. So I get the request for dad like this time of year comes get in the pool. I'm like, man, I am wiped out. I've been up since whatever, 5.30 and I don't want to, I don't want to work out again. I don't want to get in the pool again. And, and so the other night, it was Friday uh, after work. And I was like, man, we finally made it to the weekend. I just wanted to chill. And, and see, my wife gets away with everything. She doesn't have to go swim in the pool with them. They, they want me. They don't want her. So she could sit out there and just chill by the pool and her feet are kicked up. And I'm like, I'm just, I got a jealousy issue happening. And I just want to chill. So, uh, so my sons are begging me to get in the pool. So finally, I go inside, put on the swimsuit, get out there in the pool. I have a great time. I end up having fun with them. I'm always the monster in the pool. That's my, my role. And playing in the pool with the kids. And then yesterday I had to run uh, one of my three trips to Lowe's yesterday for my little home project. Uh, I took my youngest with me and we were just talking. He said, dad, my favorite part of yesterday was when you chased me in the pool. And on one hand, there's a part of me that's like, yeah, I was, I was a good dad for that moment. But really what I felt was like, I felt like a moron because the, that was the last thing I wanted to do was get in the pool. And I resisted it and put them off for 20 minutes. Like, no, no, no. I just kept telling them no. And, and then it dawned on me, like, that's really what, at least at his age, that's what connection means for him is to go play. And sometimes in our parenting, it's so easy to get caught up in the training of our kids or the, or the, the schedules that we keep and all the things that we have to do. And we run and we run and we run. And we forget that this is a relationship that we want to cultivate and build. Um, not just for now, but for the future, so that we have a good relationship with these people called our children for the rest of their lives, or our lives, whichever comes first. And so I do think we have to have a mixture of good boundaries and, and good rules and accountability and, and all those things, but we also have to have a lot of fun. We have to be able to play. We have to have time to make a mess. We have to have time to uh, just do goofy things and giggle and play and laugh. Um, and, and I know those things, the appropriate expression of that happens with every phase of life and every phase of your child's development. And, and, and we have to embrace those things or we'll miss out on what really uh, is most important in this whole journey. But I hope this stuff is helpful to you. Uh, I really think these are the, I have not found a phase of, of, of parenting that gets beyond these four things. I think if you have a toddler or you have a teenager, uh, these four things apply, and and even adult children. We have to be willing to come back to these four things, and th these are the expectations. We put boundaries and expectations around these things, and and there there are consequences associated with with this behavior. So it's very important that we we hold these things up. So uh, last thing I want to say to you guys is uh, because of the situation we're in with uh, being at home and spending all this extra time with our kids. As much as we've all seen it on social media, we've all been thinking it and saying it, I still think it's a challenge for us to, to see this time uh, for as much family good as we could. Um, we're, we still tend to get dis over distracted on social media. We, get, we, get, we go and put our, our energy in all these other things, and we have these unique opportunities to be with our families. And um, just knowing many of you and watching what you've been doing this summer, it's been inspiring and, and good for us to see how families are making the most of this time. But I also know that underneath all of that, there's, a, there's still just a lot of pressure and a lot to keep up with with our kids. But let's not, not miss the opportunity to take advantage of this time. Because again, looking down the road and parenting is always a long game. When you look down the road, 
one day your kids are going to look back and they will either have a reasonable picture of God's authority in their life or they won't. And, and that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for in this whole journey. So uh, I do want to pray for us and, uh, and wrap up our time. So if you would, right where you are, just uh, take a moment to pray and we'll ask for God's help on all this. God, we come to you and we, we thank you for being a perfect heavenly father. God, when we think about our lives and uh, God, as we do these things in our own lives with you, we disobey, we are disrespectful, we are often dishonest, and we are even defiant towards your leadership in our lives. God, we want to confess that as sin against you and say that we're sorry. Uh, God, we want to reflect um, an obedient and, and responsive spirit to you. And so, God, I pray that we would uh, lead our families well. God, that we'd be good moms and dads, uh, good grandmothers and grandfathers, and God, that you would uh, lead us to be the kinds of uh, men and women you want us to be. And I pray for all of our children, God, that they would benefit uh, from the effort we put forth, uh, knowing, God, that they're, they're following after you. They're coming in, in on the path that you have them on. And I pray that you would uh, lead our children, bring them to faith in you, help them trust in you. And God, I pray that you give us your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let me make a couple of uh, final announcements for you guys. Um, don't forget, if you have students, middle school and high school students, we're doing a little swim party over at our house tonight. Um, that information will be in the chat bar, and I believe it's also in your email. Uh, if you don't check your email every Sunday morning, we do send an email out with all of the information for the week. Um, we have our Thursday Zoom at 1130. Um, what else we have? Lunch, or excuse me, not lunch. Dinner at my house. Uh, on a Wednesday night coming soon. So if you've not signed up for that, we would love to host you uh, for dinner at our house. It's one of the ways that we're trying to stay connected with folks in the church during this time where we can't get the whole group together. Um, we are aiming for July 19th uh, to be together again. So uh, hopefully that will get us uh, far enough into uh, in the improvements around the COVID-19 thing, and we'll, we'll be able to gather and, and have more of a uh, a, a church service like we all uh, remember. So remember that. We're going to try to find that again. Um, I, oh, uh, also, for those of you um, who are able to give during this time, we, uh, we don't pass a plate because we're on Zoom, but we do have electronic giving for offering. If you um, are prepared to give an offering, you can do that um, uh, electronically at gracevalleymemphis.org slash give, gracevalleymemphis.org slash give. And uh, for those of you who've been giving faithfully during this uh, whole quarantine time, thank you for doing that. That's uh, a huge help. And if you're not able to give, if you're out of work or you've uh, ha had other challenges in that way, uh, we don't want you to feel any pressure on that. But we do appreciate those of you who've been able to give. And uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and hope you guys have a great Sunday afternoon. And uh, if I don't see you uh, tonight for students or Wednesday for dinner or Thursday for lunch hour. I'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day.